Welcome to the Steam Locomotive Valve and Valve Gear Tutorial Series. I'm Dan Oberklein. In this first video, we'll examine valve operation and the components of the valve train that control the flow and distribution of steam used to drive the engine. We'll cover valve design and function, looking at the arrangement of the valve mechanism and how it works, steam passages in the cylinder casting that convey the steam into and out of each end of the cylinder through ports, and valve motion. Before we can understand valve gear, we first need to understand the kind of motion the valve needs so it can produce the correct admission and exhaust of steam from the cylinder. In later videos, we'll look at Walshirt and Baker valve gear and see how they provide the motion to allow the valve to switch steam into and out of the cylinder properly. To illustrate the valve operation, we'll use the running gear of the CNO class K4 Kanaw type. It's a 284, one of the famous Van Swearingen Berkshires, and a fine example of modern steam design at the height of its development. The K4 was the most versatile locomotive class on the CNO in the late steam era, being found in every type of service with its ideal mix of speed and pulling ability. Mechanically, it is nearly identical to the Berkshires on the Nickel Plate Road and the Pair Marquette which were also designed by the Advisory Mechanical Committee of the Van Swearingen Roads. In addition to their superb performance, these locomotives have many details that were widely copied and were shared by many other locomotive classes late in the steam age, making the CNO Kanaw type an ideal example for illustrating how a steam locomotive works. If we zoom in and take a close look at the cylinder casting, we can see the basic structures employed to distribute steam to and from the cylinder. First, we have the large main cylinder where the drive piston is located. Above, we have a smaller cylinder that houses the valve. We can also see these two bridge-like structures that house the steam passages that allow the steam to move between the valve chambers and the cylinder. Now, let's move up and get a look from above the cylinder. This is the main steam delivery pipe that delivers steam from the throttle. It is a wide, large diameter pipe to minimize the pressure drop as steam flows through the pipe to the valve and cylinder. We can also see the exhaust duct that carries the exhaust steam out of the cylinder. This duct connects to the two exhaust chambers at the front and back ends of the valve cylinder and leads through the cylinder saddle to the exhaust nozzle at the bottom of the smoke box. These exhaust passages need to be made as wide open as possible because they handle low density steam that has expanded in the cylinder and we want this large volume of steam to exit the cylinder with as little back pressure as possible. One further detail that is kind of hard to see because it's hidden in the shadows is this pipe that connects to the side of the exhaust duct. This pipe bleeds off some of the exhaust steam and delivers it to the feed water heater, where the steam is used to preheat water being pumped into the boiler. Moving back a little, we can see how the steam delivery pipe connects to the center portion of the valve cylinder, which is often called the steam chest. We can also get a better look at how the exhaust duct connects to both ends of the valve cylinder, collecting exhaust steam from both the front and back ends of the cylinder. To get a better view of the steam passages, let's remove the cylinder heads and look inside. First, let's look inside the front of the valve cylinder. It might help if we shine a flashlight in here to see a little better. Moving in a little closer, we are looking inside the front exhaust chamber. This space, located in front of the valve spool, is where steam exhausts from the front side of the cylinder. Here we can see the front of the valve. Like all modern steam locomotives, this locomotive has piston valves, which move inside a cylinder like a piston. They are sometimes called valve spools because they are shaped like a spool, which will become more clear when we see the entire valve. The cylinder within which the valve moves is called the valve cage. The valve cage is one of the most critical parts of the entire valve mechanism. 
and we'll take a closer look at it in a few minutes. And now we're looking into the giant exhaust duct that provides a clear path for that low density, low pressure, greatly expanded steam to escape. Turning back to the valve, we can see the ports arranged in a circle all around the valve cage. The ports are the gateway to the steam passage leading to the cylinder below. Steam flows through the ports and the passage when the valve is opened to either admission or exhaust. This valve we are looking at here has opened the front side of the cylinder to exhaust, and that is why the ports are visible to us now, providing a clear path for steam to flow from the cylinder and steam passage below up through the ports and into the exhaust chamber where our camera is located. One other interesting feature of the piston valve we can see here is that the valve spool is hollow inside and we can see all the way through to the rear exhaust chamber on the other side of the valve. This means that exhaust steam has a clear path from one end of the valve to the other and can equalize the pressure acting on the ends of the valve at all times. This way there is no force imparted on the valve spool with each exhaust release, and the valve motion is smoother. If we want to see the steam passage leading down to the cylinder, we need to remove the valve cage and spool. And here is the path taken by the steam entering and exiting the cylinder. Finally, we are now inside the cylinder where we can see the front of the piston. And we're looking back up at the bottom end of the steam passage where it opens into the cylinder. To get a complete picture of the valve and steam passages, it helps to look at a transparent view so we can see how all the parts fit together. Looking through the cylinder casting here, we can see the main piston inside the cylinder and the valve cylinder above. At each end of the valve cylinder, we can see the exhaust chambers, highlighted in blue, one in front of the valve to collect steam exhausted from the front side of the cylinder, and one behind the valve to collect steam exhausted from the back side of the cylinder. The center portion of the valve cylinder, highlighted in white, is the steam chest. This space is connected to the steam supply pipe entering from the top and is always pressurized with live steam any time the throttle is open. We can also see the transparent outline of the steam passages connecting the valve with the two ends of the cylinder. If we highlight the passages, we can see how they extend circumferentially all the way around the valve cages, lining up with the ports that are arranged in a circle all the way around as we saw from inside the exhaust chamber. This provides maximum area for steam flow through the ports and into the passages. And here we can see the entire piston valve, and it becomes apparent why it is called a spool. A piston valve consists of two identical valve sections, with the steam chest providing the steam supply in the middle section between the two valves. It is really four valves in one, with one spool simultaneously controlling the admission of steam to both ends of the cylinder and the exhaust of steam from both ends of the cylinder. It's an ingenious device, and the opening and closing of the valve is accomplished by moving the edges of the valve past the edges of the ports on the valve cages. In this view, we can see the four valve rings that make a steam-tight seal against the inside wall of the valve cage. Each of the four rings corresponds with one of the four functions that this four-in-one valve performs. And here we have the two valve cages, one containing the ports for the front of the cylinder and one containing the ports for the back of the cylinder. Because it is such an important part of the overall valve mechanism, it is worth taking a closer look at the valve cage and how it interfaces with the valve spool to create the opening and closing events. The valve cage has ports arranged in a circle all around its circumference, and that provides maximum area for the steam to flow through. All these ports must be lined up precisely, because we want them all to open or close simultaneously when the valve ring passes the port edge. 
This means the valve cage is one of the most precisely machined parts on the locomotive. Let's add the valve spool to the picture and see how the interaction of the spool and the ports accomplishes the opening and closing of the valve. In this view, the valve spool is in the same position as we saw inside the front exhaust chamber of a locomotive. It is slightly open to exhaust. It's a little hard to see in this view because the valve is open only slightly, but it is the position of the ring edge relative to the port edge that matters. And if we move back a little and look from a slightly different angle, we can see that the valve is clearly open. The area of all those ports adds up and allows plenty of space for steam to flow through, even when the valve is open only partially. If we now put the valve in motion while keeping an eye on the edges of the valve ring and the port, we can watch the gap narrow until the valve is closed. At this point, the port openings are covered by the valve rings and steam can no longer flow through the port openings. Continuing the valve motion, we now watch the other edge of the port. This is the steam edge, the inside edge of the port that borders on the steam chest. As soon as the inside valve ring emerges from behind the cage and uncovers the steam edge of the port, the valve is open to the steam chest, and steam can flow through the ports and into the steam passage, where it is admitted to the cylinder. And if we follow along with this motion, we see the valve reverse its motion and start moving backward until it closes off the flow of steam from the steam chest. This is the valve event called cutoff, when steam admission to the cylinder is cut off and the ports are once again closed off to steam flow. And a little further in the stroke, we turn again to the exhaust edge of the port. And when the outside ring uncovers this port edge, the valve once again opens to exhaust and the steam in the cylinder is released to exhaust. We can now appreciate how the valve operation can be degraded by imperfections in the valve cage. For example, if the cage is not seated squarely in the cylinder casting, it will not be coaxial with the spool, and the valve ring will not cross the port edges simultaneously. Similarly, if the ports are imprecisely machined, they might not have a common edge, and again the result is that the ring will not cross all the port edges simultaneously or some of the ports might have edges that are not cut straight. Any of these imperfections will cause imprecise valve events, blurring the transition between open and closed, which will lessen the locomotive's performance. Returning to the locomotive, we have seen how the steam chest is the space located in the center of the valve cylinder, between the two ends of the valve. For this reason, the valve we have here is called an inside admission valve. The high pressure steam is admitted over the inside edge of the ports from the steam chest space in the inside portion of the valve cylinder. The exhaust is routed to the exhaust chambers located in the outside regions of the valve cylinder. It is possible to have a valve that is set up in the opposite fashion, with the high pressure steam being admitted from the outside regions beyond each end of the valve and the exhaust being collected in the center space on the inside of the valve cylinder. This would require the steam supply and exhaust ducts in the cylinder casting to be reversed, with the live steam from the throttle now being delivered to each end of the valve, and the center cavity now being connected to the exhaust nozzle. Outside admission is usually seen on older locomotives with slide valves, which must be set up in this manner to hold the valve down against the valve seat. Outside admission piston valves do exist, but they fell out of favor as steam pressures increased, making it more beneficial to have the steam chest located in the center cavity, where no rod packing is required to provide a seal. The best way to see the valve motion and study the valve events is to look at a cutaway view of the cylinder casting. Here we can see the valve spool inside both valve cages, and we can now see how the ports in each valve cage are surrounded by the steam passage to allow steam to flow through the ports on all sides. If we continue cutting away the casting, down into the main cylinder, we can see the piston. This now looks just like the usual cutaway view shown in all the textbooks, 
with the steam passages leading down to the cylinder cut along the center line. Let's now start the locomotive moving forward and watch how the valve works to control the flow of steam. First, we need to move the reverse lever into the corner, putting the engine into full forward gear. We'll show how this is done in later videos, but right here, we can see that the valve spool has moved and the front side of the cylinder is now open to the steam chest. If we crack the throttle a little, the steam chest immediately fills with steam, which begins flowing through the open port and down into the cylinder. Finally, the locomotive starts to move. And now steam is admitted to the rear of the cylinder to push the piston back to the front. If we focus just on the front side of the cylinder, we see that steam admission begins when the steam ring on the valve uncovers the steam edge of the port, just like we saw in the close-up views of the valve cage. And when the steam ring moves past the steam edge again and the port is covered, steam can no longer flow into the cylinder from the steam chest, and we have cut off. When the piston nears the end of its stroke, the valve has moved along so the exhaust ring uncovers the exhaust edge of the port, and the steam inside the cylinder is now released to exhaust. The cylinder remains open to exhaust during most of its return stroke, allowing steam to escape until the pressure inside the cylinder is nearly at atmosphere, until finally the exhaust port is closed off when the valve returns to cover it. In this animation, the colors represent temperature and pressure of the steam. Red is the hottest, highest pressure live steam from the boiler. Blue represents the coolest and lowest pressure steam, which is found in the exhaust steam as it exits the cylinder. And intermediate colors represent steam that has partially expanded and cooled. And we can see that the same sequence of events follows at the back end of the cylinder, controlled by the other half of the valve interacting with the port edges on the rear cage. Watching the piston and valve go through their motions, we can begin to see a pattern. If we look at the point when the piston is at the back of the cylinder, we see that the valve is somewhere near the middle of its range, still moving toward the back. A short time later, when the piston has moved to the middle of its stroke, the valve is just now reaching the back of its travel. And when the piston reaches the front of the cylinder, the valve has started moving forward but has only gotten about midway toward the front of its range. And now the piston is in the middle of its rearward stroke, and the valve is just now reaching the front. This sequence illustrates the most important point in this entire video, which I will call valve motion rule number one. The valve motion is about a half stroke behind the piston's motion. This is one quarter of a full motion cycle, or 90 degrees out of phase. The valve moves through a much shorter stroke than the piston, but it is the relative position within each stroke, or the phase position, that we are talking about here. The piston stroke on our K4 is 34 inches which is about the longest stroke you'll ever see on a steam locomotive. The valve's travel is variable, but when it is in full gear like we're showing here, the valve travel is 8 inches. That means any given point on the valve moves over a range of 8 inches throughout the valve's cycle. That gives an idea of the scale we are looking at here, and it also leads into our next observation about the valve. We have seen how the valve sometimes covers both edges of the steam port, sealing off the cylinder to steam flow. This occurs because the valve rings are positioned further apart than the port width. Because this is so important, we need to take a close look and find a clear way to define these measurements of the valve. The valve measurements are defined by the relative position between the valve rings and the port edges when the valve spool is in its centered position. To find the location where the valve is centered, we take the center lines of the ports on the front and rear cages, and the line that lies halfway between is the geometric center. 
When the center of the valve spool itself coincides with this line, then the valve is centered in the chamber and lines up exactly the same with the front and rear ports. One of the first things we observe here is that the valve extends beyond the steam edge of the port, overlapping the wall of the cage for a short distance. This is the steam lap, and it is one of the most critical measurements on the entire locomotive. The steam lap means that the valve is wider than the port openings, and that allows the valve to seal off the ports during part of its motion. This is how we achieve expansion of steam inside the cylinder. On our K4, the steam lap is 1 and 11 sixteenths inches. The back end of the valve has an identical steam lap extending beyond the steam edge of the rear ports. If we put it in motion again, we can see how the periods when the port is lapped and the steam is trapped are the periods when the steam is expanding in the cylinder, getting more energy from the same charge of steam to do work pushing on the piston. You could build a steam engine with a valve that has no steam lap at all. It would look like this, where each end of the valve is exactly as wide as the port. And when we put it in motion, we see that there is no expansion of steam in the cylinder. Each end of the cylinder is always in either admission or exhaust. The incoming flow of admitted steam drives the piston all the way to the point of exhaust release and the transition from admission to exhaust is practically instantaneous. In an engine like this, the steam being shot up the stack exits the cylinder at the same pressure it entered with, wasting a lot of energy that could be used to continue pushing on the piston if it were allowed to expand to lower pressure before exhaust release. Going back to our normal valve that has steam lap, we also need to look at the exhaust edge of the valve to find another important valve parameter. With the valve centered, let's look at how the valve lines up with the exhaust edge of the port. If we mark the exhaust edge of the port and now mark the exhaust edge of the valve, it appears that they are exactly in line. This condition is common in locomotive valves and is called line and line. As soon as the valve moves off this center position, either the front or the back end of the cylinder will incur exhaust release, so one end of the cylinder will always be open to exhaust. However, if we zoom in and look closer, we can see that the valve and the exhaust edge of the port are not, in fact, line in line here. There is actually a very small open gap, 1 16th of an inch in this case, and this is called exhaust clearance. This is common for locomotives intended for high-speed service because exhaust clearance means that the valve opens to exhaust a little earlier in the stroke than it otherwise would, which allows the cylinder to breathe better and clear out each charge of steam while leaving less back pressure. To examine the final valve parameter, we look at the valve position when the piston has been moved to the end of its stroke, in this case back dead center. Zooming in again to look closely at the valve, we see that the valve has already opened slightly, 
This means that the valve actually opens to admit steam a short time before the piston begins its next stroke. And for this reason, the admission event is technically called pre-admission. This is measured by the distance that the valve has opened when the piston is on dead center, which we are viewing here, and this is called the lead. On our K4, the valves are given a lead of 3 16th of an inch. By opening the valve to admission shortly before the piston begins its stroke, the valve will continue to move and will be further opened earlier in the piston's stroke. This is the primary purpose of lead, to provide wider port openings earlier in the piston's stroke, which allows steam to flow freely into the cylinder with a minimum of pressure drop as it passes through the ports. Looking at the valve's position here and comparing it to the valve's position when centered, we can make an interesting observation. In order to get the valve open by this amount, the valve must be shifted so the steam ring edge moves from here to here. And that means the valve must be moved away from center in the direction of the piston by the amount of the steam lap plus the amount of the lead. This is an important boundary condition that any valve gear operating this valve must be able to satisfy if it is to provide the amount of lap and lead specified by the locomotive designer. This additional displacement needed to get the valve open is why the valve was approximately, but not exactly, a half stroke behind the piston's motion in our earlier motion study. It is helpful at this point to summarize the main parameters that characterize the dimensions of the valve. And we can summarize the foregoing discussion of valve parameters with the second most important point of this entire video, which I will call valve motion rule number two. The steam lap allows the steam to be worked expansively in the cylinder, and the valve must be displaced from center by the amount of the lap plus the lead when the piston reaches either end of its stroke. At this point, We'll take a brief digression and look at slide valves. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on slide valves because they are an older technology that was largely replaced by piston valves in the early 20th century. Nevertheless, slide valves are important because they were the only kind of valve used on locomotives from the beginning of steam to the turn of the century, and you will still find them on some locomotives operating on tourist railroads today. Best of all, they work using essentially the same motion we have already seen for piston valves. The first major difference we see is that the valve is not contained within the cylinder casting. Instead, we have a flat valve seat machined on the top of the cylinder casting. Here are the ports leading to the front and back sides of the cylinder, and the ports here are straight and flat. This is another major difference from the piston valve, where the ports extend all the way around the circumference of a cylinder housing the valve. Here in the middle, we have the opening to the exhaust duct. And the steam supply from the throttle enters here, through these openings. The valve itself is this hollowed out block that sits on top of the valve seat and slides back and forth. The whole thing is then enclosed by the steam chest, which is bolted down on top of the cylinder casting. Looking at a cross section, we have the exhaust duct and the steam supply ducts all built into the cylinder casting. And this entire space inside the steam chest is pressurized with live steam anytime the throttle is open. Slide valves are always outside admission, so the valve opens to admission when one of its outside edges uncovers the port to expose it to the steam chest. The hollow cavity in the center of the valve allows steam to flow to exhaust when it opens to either one of the ports. Putting it in motion, we can see how each port is alternately connected to the steam chest and then to the valve's center cavity as the valve slides back and forth from one side of the port to the other. The motion here is about a half stroke off from the piston, like we saw before, but here the valve is a half stroke ahead of the piston instead of a half stroke behind.
Up until now, all the valve animations we have looked at have shown the valve in full forward gear. This means that the valve gear is imparting maximum motion to the valve, moving the valve through its entire 8-inch travel. We just saw how the portion of the stroke when the ports are lapped is when the steam is permitted to expand in the cylinder. If the valve's travel is spread out over its maximum possible distance, that means there is a good portion of the stroke when the valve is not lapping the ports, so the port is open to the steam chest for a greater portion of the stroke. The admission phase lasts longer, cutoff occurs late in the piston's stroke, and there is only a short portion of the stroke when the steam is held in the cylinder for expansion. This is measured by the percentage of the piston stroke at which cutoff occurs. We can see here that the piston is at 28.9 inches, and 28.9 inches out of a 34-inch stroke is 85% cutoff. In full gear, the piston is being driven by live steam at full steam chest pressure for 85% of its stroke, leaving only a small percentage of the stroke to be driven by expansion of the steam already in the cylinder. We can also measure the cutoff on the rear side of the cylinder, and we see that 29.2 inches out of a 34-inch stroke gives 86% cutoff. Ideally, the front and rear cutoffs would be identical to make the locomotive run smoothly, but differences of a couple percent are common and do not adversely affect performance. If we hook up the reverse gear to shorten the valve's travel, we see that cutoff is now occurring earlier in the piston's stroke, leaving a greater portion of the stroke to run off of expanding steam. Here, cutoff is occurring when the piston has moved about 17 inches, meaning that we are operating at 50% cutoff. Less steam is being admitted into the cylinder and we are operating more efficiently by letting that steam push on the piston for longer before exhausting the steam at lower pressure than before. We can hook it up further, and now cutoff is occurring very early in the piston stroke when the piston has traveled just a little more than 20% of its stroke. valve's travel has really been shortened. Now the valve is traveling over a range of only about 4 inches compared to its full travel of 8 inches. This means that the valve spends its time closer to the center position and it never travels to these far regions that it visited before. As a result, a much greater portion of the valve's time is spent lapping the ports, allowing a long period for steam expansion in the cylinder. We can see that the shorter valve travel also means that the ports don't open as wide for admission because the valve doesn't move as far away from them. This is one of the prices we must pay for using a single valve spool to control admission and exhaust at both ends of the cylinder. And exhaust release also occurs earlier than before. This means that we lose some of the benefit of the shorter cutoff because 20% cutoff does not mean that the remaining 80% of the stroke is all available for expansion. This is again an unavoidable result of the compromise we are making by using a single valve spool to control all of the valve events. As we close the throttle and watch the engine come to a stop, we can summarize these observations of changing the valve cutoff as valve motion rule number three. 
Shortening the length of the valve's travel causes cutoff to occur earlier in the piston's stroke. One final and very important function that the valve must fulfill is to allow the engine to run in reverse. Looking at the current view of the piston and valve, remember that when we stopped the engine's forward motion, the piston was moving toward the front. Therefore, to initiate reverse motion, steam must be admitted to the front side of the piston to push it back in the opposite direction. And here when we move the reverse lever into full reverse, we see the valve move to a position that opens the front port to admission. Reversing the engine is really not as complicated as it sounds because all the same rules of motion that we have already learned still apply. The valve motion is still roughly a half stroke behind the piston's motion, and the valve must still be displaced by the amount of the lap plus the lead when the piston reaches either dead center. In fact, as we watch the engine run here, viewing only the valve and piston, it is impossible to tell whether the engine is running in forward or reverse. The only way to tell from the view here is to watch the small slice of the wheel visible at the far left of the screen. Because forward and reverse motion are both driven by the same back and forth reciprocating motion of the piston, it follows that the sequence of valve events required to produce this motion should be the same. What has changed when we reverse the engine is the piston's direction of movement at any given orientation of the wheel, or angle of the crank pin. In order to keep the valve's motion a half stroke behind the piston's motion, reversing the engine requires some mechanism to adjust the point on the wheel where the valve's motion is taken from. This will be a central point in the next video when we examine the valve gear mechanism. We have seen how the valve performs four functions through the use of four rings divided between the two ends of the valve. We have seen how the valve switches the flow of steam to the ports by traveling from one side of the port to the other side. And we have seen how this motion of the valve can be described by three general rules. These rules form the basic requirements that guide the design of a valve gear mechanism to operate the valve. The next step is to build up a mechanism step by step, applying these rules to obtain the proper motion at the valve stem. We'll start with wall shirt valve gear because it is simpler and easier to understand, and it was historically the first of these side-mounted valve gears to be developed. Then we'll look at Baker valve gear and see how it uses a different arrangement of levers to accomplish the same goal. I hope you'll join me for these additional videos coming soon.